what I'm talking about today is, is effectively our joint graduate program. So in our master's in biomedical engineering is a joint program between the University of Texas at San Antonio and also the medical center at UT Health, which creates a unique environment where students can apply engineering and concepts from engineering to addressing human health, right? And so the title of our talk is Engineering the Future of Human Health, which is about uh, this joint master's program. Next slide, please. Um, so our faculty are, are throughout the campuses. We're part of, as Dean Browning discussed, the Margie, Margie and Bill Clessy College of Engineering and Integrated Design. Um, what this shows right here is the Science and Engineering Building, which is a brand new building completed last year, where some of our faculty have their labs and some of the courses um, you can be involved with work here. There's also a maker space that a lot of our students utilize for design projects and various other activities. Next slide, please. Ooh, I didn't make these slides, so I don't know what's going to pop up periodically, but our program has grown substantially over the last five years. So we've uh, increased our faculty by three times. Um, we are very diverse faculty, um, faculty from all over the nation um, and all over the world. We have uh, increased uh, the number of students significantly. So we are a rapidly growing department. And most importantly, maybe related to uh, graduate programs is we've increased our research funding significantly, which creates the new faculty, uh, the new funding creates a variety of opportunities for students to get involved in graduate research and laboratories doing cutting edge research um, in, in biomedical engineering and addressing complex problems in engineering health. So our areas are, are broad, there's a variety of areas to get involved in, but some of the primary areas of, of emphasis are in biomaterials, regenerative medicine, biomechanics, brain health and neuroengineering, uh, medical imaging, nanotechnology. We actually have a number of faculty who are interested in engineering education. So if you're interested in educating the next uh, future engineers, um, this is another area you can get involved in, soft matter, musculoskeletal engineering and, and biosensors. So there's a broad range of opportunities with all of these faculty that you can engage with as part of our graduate degree program. Next slide, please. So overall, our goal is to train future scholars in the use of basic biomedical approaches for the investigation of fundamental bioengineering questions associated with the diagnosis and treatment of human diseases. And actually one of the interesting things about our program is while I listed those 24 faculty in our department, you can work with faculty across the college, across the university, and in, within the medical center, right? So there's certainly faculty in biomedical engineering, but also faculty in mechanical engineering who are doing biomechanics and medical device work, faculty in, in electrical engineering doing medical informatics and data science, Scott faculty from biology and physics who are different doing nanotechnology and brain health work that you can perform thesis work or projects with as part of this program. And at the medical center, you can be involved with faculty in the School of Medicine, School of Dentistry, or the Graduate School of Biomedical Science. So there's a huge breadth of opportunities to get involved with in this master's program. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, so the master's in biomedical engineering, again, there's so many labs to choose from. There's 63 labs to choose for research. So faculty, you can work with on your project. So whatever you're interested in, I believe you can find um, these opportunities. They're state-of-the-art core research facilities. And as I mentioned before, a brand new makerspace where you can design and fabricate devices, use 3D printers to prototype new ideas. Um, so state-of-the-art equipment, state-of-the-art um, technologies that you can use, right? And we emphasize inclusive excellence, community impact, and cross-disciplinary research training. And we're focused on rapidly growing areas, including human performance, re uh, regenerative medicine, and artificial intelligence. Um, so there's all kinds of areas to get involved in, again, as I mentioned previously. Next slide, please. As I said before, we are, so 15 minutes away is the UT Health San Antonio Medical Center. So students, so this is one, the largest single health sciences uh, university in South Texas. It's tier one research, just like we are. So high level of research. Um, there's five basic science five departments, over 12 core facilities. The medical center has over $309 million of annual research, uh, external research funds. They have very impressive institutes addressing important medical issues, including the Mays Cancer Institute and the Glenn Biggs Institute. Um, 
so what happens in this program is that students take courses at both campuses. So you get the medical side, you get the engineering side, and you can choose to focus on electives or research at either of the campuses, depending on your interests. So if you're more interested in certain aspects of say, uh, dental applications of materials, you can focus there. Or if you're more interested in material design or, or some of the data science sides, you can focus more on the opportunities available on UTSA's campus. So this joint program really opens up the things you can do and you can tailor your education to, to your interests and what, what you're enthusiastic about. And then if you perform a thesis, our program has thesis and non-thesis options. But if you do a thesis, you would have faculty from both campuses involved in your thesis, right? So you get that exposure across the breadth of, of medical research. Next slide, please. Again, if you do the master's, there's core areas of expertise that we mentioned before, including regenerative medicine, biomechanics, human performance, biomaterials, imaging, systems biology, cell biology, and molecular engineering. <laughs> And again, you can tailor both. The, there's courses in these areas, there's research programs in these areas that you can kind of choose how to drive your, your education. Um, and there's these institutes and centers that, that um, as mentioned before, that support your research. So they provide core facilities, they provide um, uh, core expertise and knowledge and exciting seminars and things of that nature to enhance your educational experience. Even some funding opportunities for students and pilot projects. So this again includes the Institute of Regenerative Medicine, the AI Matrix Consortium, the Human Performance Initiative, the Brain Health Consortium, and the Glenn Biggs Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases. So the, all of these resources are available to our students um, in the, the graduate program. Next slide, please. So the graduate research training that you get here, in addition to you know, the coursework is you can get core labs where you can get hands-on training on some of the state-of-the-art genomics techniques, cell analytics, single cell analysis, advanced imaging tools, and medicinal chemistry, right? The College of Engineering and Integrated Design, the Clessy College of Engineering and Integrated Design, provides opportunities for learning, advancing your knowledge in coding and programming, data workshops, the AI matrix workshops and seminar series. Um, and so we support a variety of ways that also help students find a five fellowship opportunities and get grant proposals themselves. Um, and then there's again at UT Health, a number of core facilities. So you have access, when you graduate with your master's, you have the research experience and the core teaching, but also the skills that you want on your resume to enhance your potential for, for your next career down the line. Learning how to use these techniques that are readily available to all of our students is a great opportunity. Next slide, please. So again, these are some of the research areas. So just in, again, to reiterate in the master's program, you can choose to do a purely course master's work on projects and labs as part of courses, or you can actually uh, complete a thesis with a faculty member in many of these areas. So a couple of examples, just to put forward a few things that students are involved in. Uh, next slide, please. There's a project on brain in a dish models, right? So there's a significant amount of research on in campus in the uh, uh, Brain Health Consortium and, and Neuroscience Institute and regenerative medicine around uh, brain in a dish models. So developing uh, models to study brain health, brain function, uh, cognitive uh, health, uh, Alzheimer's and things like that. So one of the lab work and collaboration with Amina Kudub's labs and myself is creating these vascularized brain in a dish model where you take patient specific cells and create these models to study these vascularized systems and apply sophisticated data science tools to analyzing uh, the performance of these uh, model systems. Right, so this bridges everything from if you're interested in more of the cellular biology side, all the way to the data science, to the integrated uh, regenerative medicine side where you're growing uh, model tissues, right? And as a master's student or eventually a PhD student, you can get involved in projects that really span the breadth of things that you can do in this field. Next slide, please. And so uh, Dr. Romero's lab, works on uh, kind of stimuli responsive materials. So she looks at wireless neuronal stimulation. So these magnetic micro discs that we use to remotely, so they target certain regions uh, in the brain and can be remotely targeted to stimulate different responses as a way to address things like Alzheimer's or neural other neurodegenerative diseases, right? And again, this goes from understanding the, the nanotechnology uh, design, drug delivery, if that's something you're interested in, all the way again to brain health, 
neuro, uh, neuroscience and electrophysiology, right? So our projects are, are advanced, they're state of the art, and they're also integrating across curriculums. And I think one of the things that's unique about our program is this ability to work across departments, across centers and institutes and, and institutions uh, to perform really exciting state of the art research. Next slide, please. Um, and interestingly, what came out of one of the courses that was taught um, that students have an opportunity to develop in a course that introduces data science and the use of Python as a tool for, for data science. So this was derived from a project that came out of that course in which a master's student worked on developing a predictive model in Python for what exercises uh, a person should, should perform that are best for, or for back pain, right? So combining sensor-based exercise analysis with developmental information and functional biomechanics to develop an app uh, that is that they're trying to market, right? And they won the local Big Rowdy Idea competition, which is a um, competition on campus. So these students developed something straight out of a class. This was not out of a lab project, but something that they were asked to do in a class that eventually evolved into something they're trying to commercialize that has won some uh, local competitions, right? So again, there's so many different things you can do with a biomedical engineering degree, and you can get this out of your classes, but also out of the um, research opportunities and, and other training opportunities that you have throughout this program. Next slide, I think that's the end. Okay, so anyways, so that's my rather quick overview of what I think is an exciting program for students to get involved in. Always happy to answer any and all questions. What kind of advice can you provide for international graduate students in terms of preparation who would like to pursue a master's degree in biomedical engineering? I think maybe one of the things that I should have covered in the slide that's very important here is if you see the breadth of our uh, faculty and research, we are actually open to students of a variety of backgrounds. So our graduate students don't all come out of engineering. We have students that come out of biology that want to get a more engineering context. Um, we have students that come out of other more uh, like electrical engineering or physics or chemistry, right, that can come into our program. So the first thing to recognize is you don't have to have come from a pure biomedical engineering environment. It's actually a great opportunity. In many cases, what we get is biology students or chemistry students um, that want to kind of uh, broaden their potential industry uh, market, right? Their ability to market themselves to, to more diverse jobs or more applied jobs in, in biomedical engineering. So first of all, that's one thing to think about. Um, and, and if you are missing something, sometimes our admission will say, well, take a, an extra math course if you don't have the engineering background and it's one within our program, or if you don't have biology background, take these uh, additional courses or they'll count towards your curriculum, but just kind of modifying it to tailor it a bit to what the background is, right? So that would be, um, you know, a general point that's important. The other is international. I mean, we have a lot of international students, so I don't know that this is specific to international students, but broadly is the idea of if you, if you don't have the biology background or engineering background and you're currently in an undergraduate, taking some of those electives will, will strengthen your your case, right, or strengthen your background so you can do the work. So because of the way you can tailor your education in our program, then you can really um, focus more on the engineering side if that's your background and interests. You can get super technical. You can do all kinds of coding and data science. Or if you're more interested in the, um, say, something like regenerative medicine, where you're understanding the interface of biology with materials, right, and your background is more biology, you can focus it more that way, certainly. There is a core set of courses that you have to choose from, but you can still take that and, and focus it more around things that you want to do. How large are the classes? Are they taught by faculty? Pretty much all of our graduate program, graduate uh, classes are taught by faculty. To be honest with you, most of our undergraduates are too. We are not a program that tries to have graduate students or postdocs teach a lot of the classes. So you get that direct interaction with faculty, which I generally believe is a, is a positive aspect of this. Our graduate program's not massive. So um, the core graduate programs classes are 20 to 30 students. Uh, some of the electives can be as small as nine or 10, right? Um, I think you know, we're, we're certainly growing to some extent, but it's not going to suddenly become uh, a million 
people, right? Uh, really huge classes. And again, I think that's an advantage. It's a, as a faculty member, I like it because we get to know the students, you get that interaction and some of that can help grow. I always tell students one of the most important things you do is build your network as a student, right? Certainly doing well in your classes, but building those connections with faculty who may know of some opportunities when you graduate or help connect you with local industry. We also do with our student group, uh, a monthly activity where we have industry speakers or people who have graduated with graduate degrees, panels and things like that to help a connect you with people in the community that might help you network for jobs, but also can help you um, learn about what do you want to do when you get out. There's a lot of different things you can do. Um, and that's something to think about. There are many schools offering the master's in biomedical engineering. What makes the UTSA program unique? I think there's a couple of things. I think one, the, the, um, aspect of joint with the medical center is a, you know, not, we're not the only one in the nation, but it's certainly very rare. Right. And so that opportunity to work across, um, with the medical center, take classes there, it expands the things you can do. It gives you a different perspective when, you know, just medical centers versus a traditional university academic environment is different. Engineers think differently than biology and uh, surgeons and, and uh, endocrinologists or whomever, whomever you may end up interacting with that in that regards. Um, I think the other aspect is what I mentioned earlier about coming from diverse backgrounds as an undergrad. I, I came to UTSA four and a half years ago. My previous institution would never have admitted, admitted a master's student with a biology degree unless they'd taken three years of calculus or three semesters of calculus and some advanced engineering courses, right? And, and they tailored the graduate education to that super engineering technical side. I think this creates great opportunities for students without an engineering background to help learn the engineering concepts. It's not like it, we're not a biology program. So there is engineering, but you get it. We're, we're designed and structured to support those students. Um, and just the breadth of things you can do, I think is unique. Kind of related to that previous questions about class size. We really are engaged with our students. I tell faculty, we're interviewing somebody on campus today for a faculty job. Uh, we're not a place where you can disengage from students and run a big postdoc lab. Undergraduate and master's students know the faculty, graduate students know the faculty, and you get involved in, in real projects and make a big difference. You're important to us. Should students reach out to specific professors inquiring about their research before applying or wait and until they are admitted? You could do it either way. Um, if you know you want to do a thesis and have particular areas, it doesn't hurt to kind of get your uh, foot in the door and kind of reach out to somebody and find out. But I think a lot of our students spend the first semester, if they're a master's student with thesis, kind of looking around, asking around um, to find out what's what's available, what's really here, but you can certainly reach out to faculty. I always tell students, faculty get a lot of emails. So if you reach out once and they don't respond, it's not, they're not uh, saying no, they just might not have responded yet. Certainly you can poke them again or again and reach out and find out. But um, I think faculty do like students who are coming into a master's program who are enthusiastic about research. Um, so reflecting that when you reach out, whether it's before you get here or shortly after is a good way for faculty to say, oh, this person is serious about doing research and that makes you as a faculty member more excited. So I would say reaching out is probably more useful if you really know there's a certain area you want to work in and you're like, is this faculty member even considering the possibility, right? When you look at the most successful students in your program, what makes them so? I, I think the two things, um, one thing that I that I mentioned earlier is the ones that really build a network while you're here, right? I tell students all the time, uh, you pay a lot of money to go, you pay to go to university, right? And one of the things we provide for that, and one of the primary things we provide for that is courses, right? And you should learn what you can in your courses and get good grades, right? But we also provide a lot more than that. You have faculty who are available to you to talk to you, to, to mentor you, even if you're not in their labs, right? There'll be maybe somebody you work with in the lab, but you could also build a relationship with me and others and get involved in student organizations. There's a graduate student organization, as I said, they bring in speakers from all over who say, hey, here's what we do at our company. Here's what we're interested in. Here's the advice I would give you if you wanna get a job when you get out in this field, right? And building that network, Right? You never know what's going to come out of it. I have a slide 
these slides were developed by our program director. Maybe I'd add something in. I have a slide. So I graduated from grad school a long time ago, 03. Um, and so I have a slide where I put up all these people that I talked to in the last year that I went to grad school with, right? That are, and I don't mean that friends, there's certainly some of them are friends, some are just colleagues, but it's like that network you create will help you throughout, right? Maybe when you're looking for a job this year, when you graduate, maybe not, maybe three years later, when you're looking for a job, you know, such and such move to a different place. So there's a huge value in creating that network. And the other thing I mentioned was, um, you know, the technical skills you can get, the university provides a bunch of things that you can go learn how to do, right? At either no cost, mostly no cost, no additional cost, obviously, <laughs> tuition, right? But that all these things are there to enhance your experience. So suddenly your resume, in addition to your fantastic GPA and taking technical courses, is enhanced by these skills and enhanced in a way that you don't see in your resume is these, this community you've built of people who are working here, there, everywhere. Alumni from our program come and talk to students, right? And that that is a huge value. In research, I think it's just, um, not just, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, um, being aggressive and going after things and not waiting for it to come, right? And, and, and ask, I, what I tell students, probably the most important thing you can do is advocate for yourself. We put stuff out there to support you. We want to help you. I want to help every one of my students, but I don't know what each one of them needs all the time. We put forth what we think you need, what we know is valuable because we're in the field, but sometimes there's things, questions you have or things you're not sure about. And it's, if you come and ask, we will help you, but you sometimes have to advocate. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'd like to do. How do I get there? And then your faculty and mentors will help you get to that. But don't be afraid to ask, right? And I think that's sometimes um, more challenging as an international student, right? Certainly it's challenging in general, but recognizing that one of the things I try to reiterate to students that interact with them as chair is like, I'm here to help you out. I'm here to, you just have to let me know and don't be afraid to ask, right? So I think that's really important as a student, no matter what program you co go into. We have a very diverse faculty, so it doesn't have to be me. If for whatever reason, I don't seem like somebody you're comfortable talking to, find, find some people that you feel um, are there. And I think you can find advocate, people who are going to be supportive of you. Um, I think a lot of us would be, but certainly maybe there's certain ones you identify with more because of whatever reasons that may be. Similar background, similar interests, whatever. But um, we, we're here to help you out. Can you please talk about a little bit more about the research that you're currently involved in and how you ended in that path? I could talk about research forever. I'm the co-director of the Institute of Regenerative Medicine. So generally my research is around uh, growing replacement tissues, trying to design ways to either grow pieces of tissue for things like the brain on the dish to study how they function or to replace tissues people you lose because of trauma or because of uh, cancer resection where they remove the tumor and they have to reconstruct it. Um, so, so that's my general research area. We do a lot of things around biomaterials and cellular work um, and our students kind of dance in and out of that. We have what I think is probably one of the biggest, one, most interesting, but certainly one of the biggest emphasis is, is emphasize. I don't know how the plural of emphasis is, but um, is in the area of, of actually growing pieces of fat, which seems really unusual, um, maybe to most people, but kind of trying to understand what happens in things like diabetes and obesity. And de we're developing, we have some patents out there about developing therapeutics. As, so if we understand, rather than brain in a dish, fat in a dish, adipose is what's a more appropriate, uh, proper name, right? And developing therapies around that. So we have some nanotechnology therapies and ways to treat diabetes around this or obesity around these ideas. So that's uh, uh, what I guess I'm I'm obviously biased, but what I think is an interesting area. How did I end up in that? I'm a chemical engineer by training. So I thought I was going to go work in a refinery uh, and do petrochemical work. So I didn't know what I was doing in my life. Um, so uh, over time, I got, it's a longer story. I didn't know anything about biomedical engineering when I went to school. I knew, I didn't know much about chemical engineering. Um, um, my family didn't have any engineers in the family. So I didn't know. I liked chemical engineering. It seemed great. And then I suddenly realized I could take chemical engineering and actually do something in the medical field, which was surprising to me, interesting to me. I had a friend who had a, a disease called sickle cell anemia, a close friend. And somebody I was working with on a project was using chemical engineering concepts to understand uh, sickle cell anemia. So I was like, wow, like this is something that 
hits me personally and I could actually do something, it blew my mind. So then I started kind of researching more about biomedical engineering and that's my project didn't stay in sickle cell through various reasons and you got involved in tissue engineering and then it's a much longer story after that. But yes, you never know where your path's going to go is probably, that's the other part, not to bring it back to, to bring it back to the networking point. You don't know how, who you're interacting with today could potentially impact you five years from now. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't look at it as that's the only strategic reason not to be a jerk, right? But um, that's certainly a way to um, recognize that, that building these networks can have an impact long-term. Certainly, friendship and personal, but also professionally. So you never know what path you're going to go down. So keep your mind uh, open, your options open. And, and the nice thing about school is that's a time to figure that out. It doesn't hold it to you forever, but it helps you have the time and these things presented to you to say, do I want to go into industry? Do I want to do research? Do I want to do regulatory work? We offer things in those areas so you can learn it, figure it out, take advantage of it.